Good afternoon, everyone. Wow. Kids praise at the English International Service. That was awesome. Yeah. I love, I love watching kids sing and dance. Um, that's just, it's the best. I'm, I was with my daughter yesterday um, at home, and we were just watching some YouTube videos of, of kids dancing and singing. And that's great. Um, uh, if, you, if you hear children running all around here, I love it. I got my own, I got six of my own, and they're always running around crazy and stuff. So uh, I just want to warn you if uh, they start shouting, I'm going to shout louder. Okay? Uh, and if it bothers you, that's your problem. And so you, you can do something about it. And I'm just going to keep on uh, preaching here. So, okay. Uh, go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 25 through 35. And we're going to read it together. I'll read from verse 25 to 30. Please join me from verse 31 through 35. So, let me begin. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone sees it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Let's read together. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to ear, hear, let him hear. The very words of God. Amen? Amen? Yeah, we're in the deep end of Jesus' teaching. Everyone who has heard of Jesus Christ will probably say, Yeah, I know him. He's a, a great teacher. He teaches peace, acceptance, and love. He's the great, gentle Jesus hippie, long hair, wonderful, kind, soft-spoken, beautiful, accepting, peaceful, loving Jesus. Good teacher. Have you read this? Really? Acceptance, peace, and love. How can a teacher of love talk about hating your mother, father, wife, children, brothers, and sisters? Hmm? Acceptance, peace, and love. How could a teacher of peace preach about identifying yourself with a condemned criminal? How can a teacher of love and acceptance say three times, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciples. He says it three times. That's pretty... Pretty exclusive. Not, that doesn't sound very accepting to me. 
This is known as the hard saying of Jesus. Uh, some, some things are easy to swallow. Some things go down and it's like honey, but some things are hard. I, when I was a child, we had candy called the jawbreakers. In, in Japan, you have candy called uh, nodoame. Nodoame is just, you know, hard candy. But uh, as a child, we had something called the, the ago, ago breaker, jawbreaker. And just imagine a piece of candy that was the size of a, a ping pong ball or larger. And, you know, if you, if you bite it, it's so hard and so thick that you will break your jaw. That's why it's called the jawbreaker. And so some things that Jesus says here, they're the jawbreakers of his ministry. You don't just chew on what he says and swallow it. Oh, it's so beautiful, so easy to listen to. This teaching that Jesus gives you have to let it stay and you have to let it enter your system slowly and it has to get into your blood and it has to has to seep into your to your your meat like marinate otherwise it's no good what Jesus is talking about here is a very famous teaching many people call it the cost of discipleship uh, and I will not deny that. We're going to go with the commitment to the gospel. He is talking about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What it means to make Jesus your Lord and Master. It's your gospel commitment. Now why do we call it that? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes first for the Jew and then for the Gentile what does it mean to walk by faith and not by sight what does it mean to finish the race as a Christian not be able not having to give up you need commitment and Jesus is teaching us about that kind of commitment. Commitment that will last. Commitment that means something. Commitment that makes an impact. We'll take three headings today. Our, our scripture gives us three headings. Number one, love, endurance, influence. We'll take them in reverse order. We'll start from the end. Influence, endurance, and love. If you look at the end, uh, verse 30, uh, down to 34, 35, it talks about salt being good and not losing its saltiness. The Christian life is a life of influence, of impact. God puts us in our particular situation in order to have an influence on that situation. That's what salt does. Salt is not salt for its own sake. You don't take salt just to take salt. Maybe if you're dehydrated, sure. But for the most part, you put salt to provide flavor, you put salt to provide freshness. In other uses back then, they, not only would they put flavor and provide fleshness, they put it on the soil as part, they would combine it with the manure and then they would put it in the soil, it would be kind of, um, yeah, you know, help the trees grow kind of a thing. Or uh, they would actually, when they wanted to burn some manure because it was, you know, uh, extra, they would put salt on there and it would help it, to help it burn. So Jesus runs the gamut on all the uses of the salt, whether it's just to burn or to provide freshness or to give flavor. But if it was useless, if it lost its saltiness, what they would do is they would throw it out onto the street, just like with other garbage, and people would walk right all over it. A useless Christian, a 
meaningless Christian? Someone with no influence. Where does that influence come from? Where does that impact come from? It comes from this. God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Because God is holy, everything that God comes into contact with changes. Amen? God can't touch something without, being, without, without that thing being transformed. God can't come into contact. Jesus walked around. He touches a blind person, they see. He touches a lame person, they walk. He touches a leprous person, their skin is new. Holy, holy, holy. And God is in the business of transformation. He is transforming people, and not only people, the whole world. Romans chapter 8. The world, creation, all of creation is groaning. And it's waiting for the apocalypsis, the revelation of the children, of the sons of God. That will set them free from their bondage to decay. The world is dying and decaying. And he gives salt to provide freshness, to preserve freshness. He provides, he inhabits his people so that through his people life could have flavor. Your life as a disciple, your life as a follower of Jesus has impact whether your station is great or small whether your status is big or little listen to me you have influence I was talking to a friend a couple weeks ago they said Chris aren't you disappointed when you get up on the podium or in the pulpit and there's maybe 15 people to listen to your sermon. You spend all week studying, all week preparing, all that time meditating and getting things ready, and it, it looks so hard, and, and, and there's maybe two people, hi Michelle and hi Tim, they're on watching on YouTube, and there's a few people in the pews, and maybe uh, half of them understand everything you're saying. Isn't it disappointing that you're preaching to an empty building? Serving, uh, doing all this work in obscurity? Isn't it just, I mean, how do you deal with that? Couple of couple of things. This is not my main gig. I speak up to, I, I, God puts me in front of up to 400 students. 12 to 20 hours every week. I teach or I coach uh, basketball to 20 students every year. That's my main gig. That's one answer. Uh, the other answer is, I know I, I make it look hard. Uh, Jesus makes preaching look so easy, so effortless, and if you're good at it, that's, you know, that's how it is. I know, I make it look very difficult, <laughs> okay? Hey, you get what you pay for, all right? I don't get paid anything, so. Anyways, that's just stupid. That doesn't mean anything. Okay, here's something that will encourage you. Okay. What about the housewife? What about the unemployed? What about a Christian who doesn't see hundreds or, or tens or dozens? You know, one of my favorite authors right now, uh, tons of books all over the world. Um, he has an internet broadcast that's uh, top 20 in many countries. Uh, it's actually the number one Christian uh, pod or internet po broadcast in, I think, Slovenia. He's a yeah, random country, but immensely popular. Has reach of hundreds of thousands, maybe a million, I don't know. And I, I, I listen to him every week, and here's what he was celebrating a few weeks ago. The woman who led him to Jesus Christ just passed away and he was memorializing her. It was the mother of one of his childhood friends. 
This woman was just a housewife. She was a full-time mother. And all she wanted to do was make sure that her son knew Jesus Christ. And whoever her, her son's friends were, if they wanted to know Jesus Christ too, fine, that's okay. And Dr. Michael Heiser was one of those friends. And he was first discipled by the mother of one of his friends. And his reach goes all around the world. Do your job. Do your job unto the Lord. Do your job for Jesus. And you will have influence. You will provide flavor. And God will pre preserve freshness in this world in and through you. That's it. That's salt. Saltiness. The Christian life, commitment to God, to the gospel, is one of influence, but also endurance. That's that whole bit about the builder who, who tries to build a building, about a king who wants to go off to war. You need two things. The builder needed the foresight, forethought. He needed to, to, to count the cost of building the building. The king needed discernment to determine whether it was worth everything that he was going to lose to enter into this war, this battle, this fight. Now, if anybody is here who is a new Christian or is new to Christianity, if anybody is here who is thinking about the Bible or Jesus Christ or becoming a, a, a Christian. Listen. Take a good look at what Jesus says here. Take a good look of what it's going to cost you. And for those of you who are veterans, for those of you who have been through a few battles and you're still following Jesus, take a good look of what he says here. It should encourage you. It ought to give you a renewed hope. Because he's saying endurance. Endurance is what commitment to the gospel is about. How do you endure? What is the secret to lasting until the end? It's standing right behind me. He says, you need to pick up your cross. You need to pick it up. Now there's only one interpretation for picking up your cross. And that is this. You have to identify with a condemned criminal. That's, that's all it meant. When Jesus was speaking to the first century crowd in front of him, when he said the word cross, and when he said to pick it up, they all knew. Oh, oh, this is, this is to the death. This is to the end. And not a, not a very nice one. Right? A condemned criminal. And you say, well, wait, 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 wait. I thought Christianity was about peace, love, acceptance, uh, the glory of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. The cross? It does, that doesn't sound very positive. It sounds very negative. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who is the condemned criminal we are supposed to identify with? Who's the criminal that we're supposed to find our place with? Jesus is saying this. Please hear me. Jesus is saying this. If you follow me, it means that you have died with me. Jesus says, when I died on the cross, you died. You want some scripture? Let me give you some. Colossians chapter 3. Set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He continues and he says, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ died, you died. You're dead. You've been buried. What does that mean? This is going to encourage you. This will help you persevere. This gives you endurance. Let me show you how. 
When you identified yourself on that cross with Jesus Christ, when you have been dead and buried with him in the tomb, you know what? You know what God sees you as? You know what God does when he looks at you? When he sees you, God sees you as someone who has paid every penny for his sin. You are free from condemnation. Your life is hid with Christ. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. I've seen it plenty of times. A person becomes a Christian. They decide to become a disciple and they, they're so happy and they think, I'm free from all sin. It's going to be sunshine and rainbows from here. And they walk a couple of days and they go, wait, what? How could I say, how could I have said, how could I have done this again? How could I have fallen back into, am I a Christian? Am I a real, do I? Oh, I'm a terrible person. I'm a hypocrite. I said I'm a Christian, but I, I did this again. And here I am again. And here I, oh, woe is me. I'm guilty. I'm a terrible. I'm worse than a regular sinner because I say I'm a Christian, but I'm still a terrible sinner. And you beat yourself up and you feel so guilty and you flog yourself. Stop it. Stop that. Because when God looks at you in Christ Jesus, you've already, been, you've already been beaten. You've already been flogged. You've already been buried. You've already been stabbed. Your life is hidden with Christ. You are free from condemnation if you've picked up your cross. And so here's what you need to do. Every single day when you wake up, because Jesus says, in another place, Luke chapter 9, pick up a cross daily. So that means in the morning you wake up and you remind yourself who you are in Christ. You remind yourself what Christ did for you. You remind yourself of how God looks at you with love and acceptance and freedom. You remind yourself that you are, your life is hid with Christ in God if you pick up your cross. So there's no condemnation, but please hear me. Please hear me. You're still under arrest. When Christ says, pick up your cross, okay, a person who's under the cross, they're under arrest. In the first century, if you were to see on the street someone walking with a cross on their back, you knew that is the last thing that that person will ever do in his life, right? He's under arrest. He has no freedom. There's, there's no saying, he doesn't go, ah, oh, this cross is a little bit heavy. I think I'm just going to, this is not for me. I, you know, this was, I didn't think it was going to be this hard. No, he has no choice. He has no choice. The Christian is committed to Jesus Christ. The Christian, every decision, every idea, every motive, the Christian is committed to Jesus the way a samurai is committed to his daimyo. The way a warrior is loyal to his master. That, so listen, are you someone who thinks, look, it's, it's a gray zone. It's not so black and not so white. You know, other people in the church, they think certain things, and it's just not my way of doing things. Uh, you know, I understand what it is, but that person, she's real special to me. She knows me, and I know maybe someday she'll come to believe. Yeah, I, I know that he's not right for me, but he's got the shoulders and he's got, you know, the hands. Right? right. Um, you know, this, this job, this, this way, this opportunity, it's, yeah. I just want to ask you. I just want to ask you something. Okay. What do you base your decisions on? 
Is it based on your feelings? Is it based on the culture and what the culture is saying? Or is it based on the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Because that's what it means. You are under arrest. And it is a matter of conscience. It is not black or white some ways, but, but following Jesus, th there is there's an absoluteness about it. But listen now, if you, follow, if you pick up that cross and you give up everything, if you give up everything, you will endure. You will last. You know, uh, when I first came to Japan 20 years ago, everybody told me the church, it's old and it's literally dying. You know, you go into a church, maybe there's 20 people, into an average church, and most of the people have white hair, gray hair, 80% are about 80 years old, you know. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, that's so terrible. Oh, Japan needs a revival. Japan needs an evangelist like me to come and bring about a great awakening. Japan, you know, Japan needs crusades. Japan needs young, hip, cool people. Right? I've repented of that. Um, let's see, one of the last things I ever posted on Facebook, it's over a year ago, was a picture uh, somebody sent me. My friend, he's a pastor in Nagoya now. His father was the, was the manager of the CLC bookstore, the only Christian bookstore in Hiroshima for, for many years. And he's also a kind of um, uh, karibokushi, um, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, not a temporary pastor, okay, of churches. And he goes around to other churches who have no pastors and he helps them, you know, teaching and leading. So there's a picture of this old man at, at a table and he's surrounded, it's like a, 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 a U-shaped table. And around him are about eight or nine elderly people, all white haired, you know, gray haired. And in front of each person are two books, a Bible and an old Japanese hymnal. And the picture is very simple. They're just gathered around the table, and you could see them reading their Bible or their hymnal. And when I saw that picture, I was encouraged about the church in Japan. Here's why. Those eight or nine elderly people, they've been through the battles. They've been through some fires, and they're still here. Their faith has not died. Their faith is enduring, right? They're past their prime here on earth, but they're about to enter their prime in the next world. And they have stayed. And I was encouraged because at that point I realized God knows what he's doing with his church. Does he know how to preserve his church? Does he know how to keep his bride? Does he know how to get his people through the floodwaters and through the fire? Amen? He knows how to do that. Uh, look, my hope, my, my greatest hope is my children will pick up, you know, they'll pick up the, the mantle, they'll, they'll, they'll preach, they'll teach, they'll, they'll be faithful to Christ, and they'll hope, I hope the next generation helps bring about the awakening. I pray for an awakening. I pray for a revival. Will I see it in my lifetime? I don't know. I don't know. But I know God will take care of his church in Japan. I'm not worried about the church being old and dying. Commitment to the gospel is endurance. You will endure if you hold on to that old rugged cross. You pick it up. You submit to Jesus. And you free yourself from the condemnation that the devil is telling you. Finally, the best part Commitment to the gospel is about love. Influence, endurance, and love. There's a bit there he's talking about. Well, I, there's no word, there's no love here. There's hate. Ah, hate. Okay. Jesus says, uh, hate your parents, hate your wife, hate your children. And some of you are saying, ah, I'm, I'm already there. I got no problem. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, 
Yeah. If you have no problem hating your parents, that's another issue. Okay. There's actually, a, Jesus actually says, if you look at this more closely, there's a way to get through that. Uh, no, not enough time. But, okay, there's two meanings for hate, obviously. Anybody who reads this and understands how language works knows. I was talking with Roger last week. Jesus understands how to use language. Jesus understands how to use phrases and um, uh, 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 ways, oh, okay, I can't remember the <laughs> expressions, okay, idioms. So, in the old Semitic language, hate was used two ways. One, directly, active hostility, I hate you, I hope you die. That's one way. But then there's another way, not active, but comparative. Hate was not hostile. Hate is comparative. And that's the way it's being used here. Listen, you love your family, you love your wife, you love your kids, you love your parents. But if your love for them is one level more than your love for me, Jesus says, can't be my disciple. Can't be my disciple. Now, ah, uh, okay, I get it, I get it, I, I see, I see, I see. Jesus is saying um, he's supposed to be the priority. Jesus is saying that he's supposed to be the most important in my life. Of course he's saying that. But there's so much more. There's so much more than just being the number one, the center of your life. There's so much more than Jesus, what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not talking about duty. He's not talking about priority, mainly. Jesus is talking about love. Let me show you. He talks about the mother and father. He talks about the wife. He talks about the children and the brothers and the sisters. You know there are four words for love in Greek. There's the family love, storge. You know, love from a mother and a father. Love for your children. That's storge love. There's love for your spouse, eros, erotic love. There's also philadelphos brother and sister love and Jesus is saying the love I have for you what I'm about to give to you what I offer to you and what I demand from you makes those loves pale in comparison the stars are still out the stars are still there but there is a light that's so bright, you can't see the stars. The sun drowns out. The sun eclipses the light of all the stars. The love of God is eclipsing the love of anything that you have in this life. And if your love for your parents, your spouse, your children, those are good things. Those are great things, but if they come the, the only thing or the best thing, listen, your life is going to be out of, your life is going to be out of whack. And Jesus is saying, you can't be my disciple. You just don't understand what it takes. And here's how this helps us. This is how we go home. You see, and I, this is a point that I had to repent on this week. Look, there's, there's people that you've, if, if they acknowledge you, if they accept you, if they give you a claim, you become somebody. You, I, if I have that person's acceptance or approval, I know I'm not a bum. I know I've been, I haven't failed at life. And it's, it's more subtle than you think. I was talking with another friend the other day, and we were talking about pride, and we're talking about um, uh, the way that we want control over life, and the way that uh, we want control is through getting things, and having success, and having uh, a security in the bank, and, and having uh, people you know, that we can be over and be leaders of. And we had to repent of that, but then I also had to say, you know what, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, 
I also feel like I need to be respected and loved. And if I don't get respect, and if I don't feel loved by certain people, by my students, or by my kids, or by my uh, friends, I feel angry and frustrated. I feel conflicted and accusing. I get bitter and unforgiving. I struggle with inadequacy and esteem. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 my child, my beloved, my son, my friend, I have something to give to you that will set you free from all of that. It's my unconditional love. It's the love that bled for you. It's the love that gave its last breath so that you could live. Oh, dear friend, dear, dear beloved, are you struggling? with all of that messiness of, of unforgiveness and bitterness? Are you struggling with all that messiness of, 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 of acceptance from somebody in the past or somebody, you know, in your life? And you wonder, what, what is going on with us? Why can't we get over this? Or why can't I forgive? Why can't I say sorry first? What is it that I, that's holding me back from treating that person as if I've forgiven them? You know what it is? Let me tell you what it is. It's not that... It's not that you love them too much. It's that you don't love Jesus enough. That's what it is. Jesus... Jesus has loved with everything He's given. With all that He has for you. You know how to get over that? You love Jesus all the more. And how do you do that? You go back to the cross where he gave his love for you. Jesus, look, Jesus says, hate your mother and father. We know. He's on that cross. There's people spitting at him. There's people uh, mocking him and beating him. There's, about, there's a man who's about to give him a spear. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're... He's forgiving as people are wounding him. That's his love. And if he did that for you, oh, I, I, my, my only prayer for this sermon, my only prayer for this message is that the love of Jesus Christ will affect me and, and the people who listen so deeply that we go home today, we're lighter, we're brighter, we're renewed through the love of Jesus Christ. That's all I hope for. If you will open your heart to receive the love of Jesus that's given through the cross, you will be transformed. We're not talking about reformation. We're talking about transformation. He's not here to make you better. He's here to make you new. New creation. So I need you right now. I need you to do one thing right now. I need you to uh, look at your heart, see if there's anything in there that needs to be pulled out by the roots. I was... On my driveway this morning, I was pulling some weeds out of my, because all the rain, you know, it just took, the weeds went crazy in my driveway. And, some, and I, I realized I'm pulling some of these weeds, and some of them I can't, I pull, I pull, but I'm not pulling them by the root. And so when I don't pull them by the root, you know, they're just going to come up even stronger and more fuller. I got to get in there. I need you to pull some root, some weeds out of your heart. What is it? that is competing with the Lordship of Jesus Christ? What is it that you're giving your affection and your heart and your love and your commitment to other than Jesus Christ? Do some weeding in your heart at this time. Renew your commitment. See that He will, he will bring you to the end. And that's how you're going to stay salty, stay influential. Be an impactful person. So come to the cross. That's the invitation. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, yes, Lord, uh, let our words be few. For you are in heaven and we are here. Father, we don't want to offer the sacrifice of fools but a broken and contrite heart 
you will not deny. Uh, Father, I pray for those struggling with their commitment and submission to you. I ask that you'd help them to pick up their cross. And Father, I pray for those who have competing loves. I ask you, Lord God, to overshadow, to eclipse those loves with yours, Lord. And Father, I pray for the gospel to take root in place of the weeds. And I pray for the gospel, Lord, to bring healing, transformation, and new creation. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.